day? Well, uh, it happens. I all my formal education was in California, and I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, and there is when I, I first got interested, really interested in uh, reaction mechanisms as a, in a junior class in dealing with organic chemistry. Uh, later I, I went to UCLA and worked with Professor Bill Young and was uh, uh, in the first group of two who received PhDs in chemistry from that department. Um, I was the second. Ted Vermullen, who, who actually has uh, became later a professor in chem engineering at Berkeley, and uh, curiously, uh, in those later years, he and I had students working on the same catalytic problem involving catalysis by the, the so-called Wilkinson catalyst. But my interest in catalysis began uh, some years ago, I mean the serious interest at least, uh, where my research was focused on, on studying uh, heterogeneous catalysis, came when the PRF was first first announced that they would issue uh, grants to people who would apply, and if the, the proposal was met their approval, why you would get a small grant. And what year was that roughly? I, at the time, I was, i forgotten the year, but it was, um, oh, it, it must have been about 1950, Three thereabouts, 50, in that that period, and uh, I, I proposed to study the the uh, stereochemistry of hydrogenation and disubstituted benzene, simple ones like dimethyl uh, benzenes, the xylene, and compare that with the stereochemistry of reduction of the isomeric cyclohexenes that could be derived from these aromatic compounds. The idea was that is to compare the proportion of cis and trans isomers that are formed from the aromatic with the various isomers of isomeric olefins. And the idea was if they were, the comparison should tell me whether or not there was a direct reduction of the arene ring during a period, a single period of absorption, or whether intermediates were formed, cyclohexene. And the conclusion of this study, which incidentally was reported at the first International Congress on Catalysis, um, uh, a, which was held in Philadelphia, uh, dealt with and uh, reported the results of this first study. And uh, we uh, suggested that olefins were intermediates in that hydrogenation. These were catalysis on, on uh, I think it was platinum oxide, um, at uh, room temperature, ordinary temperature and pressures. Well, one thing has led to the other over the years. And, uh, uh, gradually, we've learned more about catalysis, did somewhat better a more carefully controlled experiments, but uh, we, uh, we we have always uh, had as a general principle of guidance that catalysis on metals must be closely related to the chemistry of uh, organometallic compounds. And uh, of course, when when the study of organometallic compounds uh, developed not too long ago, why we took advantage of the knowledge gained by others, by Wilkinson, prepared the uh, rhodium complexes, and uh, later other people, who, other inorganic chemists, who prepared compounds. 
and have used those in studies to try to see how uh, the uh, catalysis by these soluble complexes could be related to what one could observe in related experiments with, say, supported metal catalysts. And, uh, that's the area of research in which we've focused our attention in more recent years. What we'll do for now <laughs> is uh, quite uncertain, although my interest in, in uh, learning more about catalysis still remains. You still have students at the... No, I, I, I reached retirement just a year ago, uh, and uh, I still have an office and a laboratory, but I have no students. Uh, I've been doing things that uh, uh, were left undone at home, and uh, I have to clear that up. And there's some work that I have published that I think is worth publishing, and I need to do that. And there are ideas I'd like to pursue, and I think I can on my own. I, I don't expect to have a research group working with me. I, I still uh, like to, uh, to, to read literature and to uh, enjoy being a referee on papers, because that encourages me to, to study in detail some work and to, to uh, analyze it carefully to see whether or not uh, it, it meets the expectations of, uh, of the editor of whatever journal I'm working for. And what was the topic of your thesis? Oh, my, my thesis my, at UCLA was uh, actually dealt with an organometallic compound. It, it dealt with the reactions of, of aldehydes with uh, the Grignard reagent uh, prepared from benzoyl chloride. Uh, it involved rearrangements, or at least products that appear to be rearrangements of uh, the uh, addition of aldehyde to the benzoyl group. And uh, uh, it, it uh, and we were able uh, to show that that there were two major products. One of which was uh, the expected type of product, where the reagent simply adds to the al carbonyl group of the aldehyde. But uh, the second type of product involved the attack of the aldehyde in an ortho position giving rise to intermediate, which was transformed to a new Grignard reagent, which reacted with a second molecule, aldehyde. And so these two aldehyde molecules were united with a single benzyl grouping. And uh, determining that was, uh, would have been relatively trivial these days. <laughs> but in those days, it was, it took me quite a long time to figure out what what the, what the structure of the product was, how it got that way. What do you see as the biggest change in graduate studies from when you did it and now? Oh, the, the main thing is instrumentation. We had, this was at UCLA when their department was, was just, had just uh, begun the doctoral program essentially. Uh, and uh, well, during, while I was there, I recall that uh, Beckman brought one of the first UV instruments to the department to demonstrate and was used there. Uh, there was pH meters had been invented by that time. But, uh, and, and of course, and persons, one of the professors was doing crystal structures, this is Professor McCullough, and his students, uh, I remember, would uh, have ledgers full of data and carry out calculations lasting a year uh, in, in order to get at the structure of these, these crystals. Uh, when today, 
it's almost a trivial matter to get a crystal structure. That is, a crystal structure can be established in, in a few days. <laughs> and who did you work with? I worked with the Professor William G. Young, uh, who, uh, uh, this, he, he died a number of years ago. He, in turn, had gotten his degree at Caltech with uh, Professor Lucas. And uh, uh, perhaps, well, Young had probably his most famous student, and he had several. One was Winstein, who was, uh, he had as an undergraduate, and another man who's most distinguished was his, uh, John D. Roberts. But uh, the, uh, during that period when we were graduate students, which was a very wonderful time in my, my uh, scientific career. And then after your PhD? Oh, I, after I got had my doctorate, uh, I was uh, a postdoc for a year with a professor uh, Byron Regal at Northwestern. This was a synthetic uh, job. I worked on synthetic uh, chemistry. Uh, it, it was World War II had just begun, and uh, the draft board considered that what I was doing there was appropriate. And uh, but after a year, I, I went to Harvard with Professor. Bartlett, and we were working on chemical warfare agents. Although it was never clear to me just why we were doing what we were doing. I suppose that's the nature of, of having uh, secret work or doing secret work that is maybe not always, but at least in this instance, it wasn't clear what the objective was. Did you know about the napalm work there by Yes, Pfizer? the napalm work was being done outside of our lab. Uh, well, I don't know about napalm, but uh, Professor um, Fieser, who was carrying out, would carry out experiments himself on the inflammability of various materials. Some of them, I think, were used uh, to place inside of briefcases, for example, so that they could be ignited and destroyed quickly. Uh, but uh, I had no, no hand in that. I think our laboratory was really operating uh, to get, this is my guess, to get experience with a very variety of chemical warfare agents as a possible defensive measure in case war gases might be used in the invasion or during the invasion of Europe because as soon as the invasion of Europe was successful we were transferred to other work. Uh, that's my guess. I, I really don't know why we were working on what we did although it had to do with, with uh, uh, warfare agents. What do you recall about Bartlett? Uh, oh, well, Bart Bartlett was, is uh, really quite a remarkable person. Uh, his, uh, in particular, what was, I was particularly impressed with, with how clearly he could analyze a system and, and uh, understand a problem and express it clearly. Uh, I, I was, I understood that he had been uh, started to work on a, a book, a text uh, on, or, on uh, physical organic chemistry, but never completed it because of Hammett's tech book that came out about that time. And, uh, but things I've I read his papers were, were delightful reading, really clear, well, good, well to the, very much to the point. 
and uh, he, he always had good questions to ask. So I, I learned a good bit from him in, in that regard. Um, but I, after uh, after my postdoctoral position there, and when World War II was over, I came back to Northwestern for, uh, for a few months, and uh, from there I was uh, offered a position at Illinois Tech, the Illinois Institute of Technology, which is uh, located very close to the loop in Chicago, that was the center of the city. Uh, it was a rather unattractive place in a physical sense, but it was a position and uh, I hadn't thought that I would ever, I never considered doing that I would be a, a professor someday, and, but the position seemed attractive uh, one to take, and I, I, I although the, uh, my office was in an old building uh, across the street from one of the, the main lines into Chicago, of the, I forgot which railroad, the building in which I taught the first year at classes uh, had uh, a steam crane coming right next to the, the building. It stopped there outside sometimes uh, for a short while and smoke and soot would come into the laboratory. So it was not very attractive at all in that sense. But after, uh, but, uh, after a year or two, I guess it was a couple of years, a new building was completed uh, for the chemistry department. And this was uh, as it had been promised when I came there that they would have a new building shortly. And uh, that came into being. Um, and so I was involved in, in uh, this, I mean, as now as a, a assistant professor in a department that was developing a graduate program, and that was a rather useful, interesting experience that I, I had academically. Uh, I guess it was at that time, really, that I got involved in catalytic hydrogenation as a uh, synthetic tool to make compounds actually substitute cyclohexanes. And uh, in, in fact, the first, our hydrogenations that were conducted there were done uh, with uh, with uh, in the equipment that Komarevsky had, because Komarevsky who was then in chemical engineering at Illinois Tech had a laboratory uh, with high pressure equipment for hydrogenations there, and uh, he he allowed us to to use his equipment for these high temperature, these uh, high pressure reduction, uh, which uh, the first my student who did these though, uh, the first time. He caused a real uh, furor in that building because the laboratory is up on the third floor. The first floor were administrative offices. And when the, my student opened the bomb after the hydrogenation and started to isolate, these were cyclohexane carboxylic acid that he was trying to isolate. Well, materials got away from him <laughs> that are just a little of the odor of these acids came down the, the, the open 
stairwells into the offices below. And I, I was informed of this by telephone from one of the, the secretaries who uh, we had got, we, we knew. And uh, she complained that I had to do something about it because it's getting, the odor getting into her hair and her clothing. And, you know, I'm going to have to throw away my girdle. Uh, uh, and, and I don't know how I'll manage without that. So, Dr. C, you have to do something. When we did, it, it turned out what we, we arranged to make sure that uh, we could uh, uh, get rid of the volatile acids and keep them and uh, uh, steam the steel in the system where we allowed no vapors to escape. And uh, this worked out quite well, but uh, even after when my student isolated the, the compounds he we wanted, which happened to be hydroxy cyclohexane carboxylic acids, and themselves were not volatile enough to cause any problems, but there there was usually a small amount of the volatile acids in the in the product anyhow. Or or someplace in the lab. And my wife would always know that when I'd been in the laboratory, when, she, when I came home, that the smell of the acids remained. That was, uh, actually that was my, my first experience with the, uh, extensive experience with catalytic hydrogenation. Although I had done some actually as a, as a graduate student. Uh, I had reduced an acetylene to the cis compound, and uh, that was a, a part of a master's program. But I, but it, there's a sort of curious thing that I think about when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley as a uh, as a junior. I took a course uh, in industrial. Oh, I'm not sure. I guess it, it's sort of industrial chemistry given by um, oh, the, this is a Professor Lewis, not Professor Lewis. It was Professor Randall. Professor Randall. Lewis and Randall. Uh, uh, Lewis and Randall was, uh, gave this course. It was just a two-hour course, but it dealt with calculations. And one of the things we had to do along the way was to do prepare a bibliography on some topic. Curiously, I selected the catalytic, hydrogena catalytic hydrogenation of phenol. Uh, I, it just struck me as that, well, that would not be too extensive a, a, a search. But uh, I found a great deal of literature at that time. This was about 19, uh, oh, that, that was about 38, no, 36, 1936. And uh, during my search, I ran across a, a book by uh, oh, God, let's see. The names come a little slowly at times, but uh, this is the Professor Cumber, uh, not. Professor Ipatia. That time, this was, he was not a professor, but this was a book that was part of his memoirs, his scientific memoirs. And uh, I ran across it while I was searching the, in the stacks of the University of California's library. And I, I sat there and scanned through it and began to read parts of it and found it a very 
interesting. It was the first time that I read what apparently was a scientific work written in the first person singular. Well, what, what makes it amusing to me is that years later, when I was a postdoc in Northwestern, uh, Professor Ipatiev at that time had established a laboratory at Northwestern, and uh, while I was there from time to time, I would see him check out chemicals from the stock room and go back to his laboratory and do further experiments. He, he must have been, oh, perhaps in his 70s by then. I don't remember how old. He seemed old to me, but then after all, I was uh, not in, I probably wasn't 30 at the time, so, uh, but uh, he was still, he was doing scientific work in the laboratory. Professor Pines was there at the time too, but I didn't know him very well until later. How, how would you describe uh, Professor Komarovsky at, uh... Well, uh, I, uh, Komarovsky, uh, oh, we didn't have a lot to do one with the other, but uh, I know we talked about various things. Uh, it, it's, uh, but it was mostly, mostly social talk. There was not a lot of very much science that we, we discussed. Uh, oh, now and then I, I would ask him about technical matters. What, I mean, I, I was a little concerned at times about setting up a laboratory a uh, pressure reactor, what sort of uh, protection we should provide for the reactor, or rather the, <laughs> the, the operators. He was, uh, in appearance, I guess, he, he was always a rather well-dressed man, dapper. But I, I, I really didn't get acquainted with him well so far as science was concerned. But as a person, what kind as, of... As a person, well, affable. I, I, again, I, I can't, I didn't have enough experience to really say very much about Komarovsky. And how did you come to go to Arkansas? Oh, that was... I, I guess what happened was that uh, about well, we were during uh, while I was at, uh, at Illinois Tech, the uh, during that time, really our, our, our work was going well. I had a number of doctoral students, uh, some phones from people from uh, URF, uh, um, but the uh, Korean War broke out, and the administration of the institute uh, was rather uncertain as to what the staff would do the following year, because they could see that perhaps their student body would decline rapidly and uh, this gave rise to a rather unsettled feeling among the faculty and we began to look read ads about positions that were might be available and uh, well we we saw one ad, a blind ad, essentially. That looked kind of interesting, but we didn't do anything about it. But then I got a letter from my brother, who was at the time at the medical school at, uh, at the University of Arkansas in Little Rock, and he wrote to me about the situation at, at Fayetteville, that they were, uh, uh, we're just deciding to 
to establish a doctoral program there. They just they decided on that. There was to be a new chairman who uh, my brother knew well and by chance happened to be a, had gotten his doctorate at at uh, Cal and at MIT with one of my former professors, Professor Coriel, and he said, well, if you're interested, you should respond to the ad. And so I decided, well, I'd write, I'd respond to the ad and see what happened. One thing led to another, and I was offered a position, and we went down to see what it was like. And one of the factors of leaving Illinois Tech was that our, our first son was born uh, just a, a few months way in March of the year that we left. We lived in the south side of Chicago. Uh, it, it did not seem a good place to raise a family. I came to Fayetteville and the hills and the, the greenery was very attractive comparison with what I had, what we had experienced in Chicago for the past six years. And we decided that uh, we could probably do as well scientifically there if it's up to us as we could in Illinois Tech, considering the situation. And uh, so we, we decided to move. Uh, so the problem, the, the decision was not, not scientific. It was based on uh, what we considered best for, the, for my family as well as allowing me to be a scientist, if, if that's what I wanted to do. And uh, uh, we've been very happy there in Fayetteville. We've done some scientific work that we think is reasonably good. And uh, I think probably we could have done more, but uh, we've done what We've enjoyed doing for many years. I was unable to be here, uh, otherwise, I would try not to uh, inflict myself on you quite so often. Uh, before introducing the speaker, let